Greetings, everyone. My name is Steve McPhail. Welcome to another Prep Hour with Steve series. It's April the 28th, 2021, and hope this finds you all very well. Now, just uh, type in your location and time into the chat while we get everything set up. Uh, today's topic is going to be live error correction. So we're going to look at some of the common errors um, that um, as OET teachers, we come across every day. Uh, and following that, uh, we're going to do a Q&A session. So it's going to be a um, slightly unstructured class today because I want to give you all the opportunity to interact and get that live feedback and, and answer all those questions that you might have. So everyone just type in a shout out, put in your location and time. And I'm just going to check now uh, to find out where everyone's located. So I can see hello to Margaret there in Zimbabwe, in Harare, it's 9am. Welcome, Margaret. Hello to Shanti and um, maybe Mose in the Philippines. Hello to Jibi in India. Welcome. Hello, Shez in Egypt. We have Jesse in India and Sethu also in India. Sethu Lakshmi. Hello, Jesse and Nika. Hello to Narinda. Lots of people coming in now. Wonderful. Let me just check with my Facebook channels everyone just bear with me one sec hello to Mithila in Bangladesh welcome Jesu in the Philippines we have Nepal is here hello to Nepal what else have we got hello to Elna in Saudi and Amber in the UK hope this time suits you uh, welcome to Nadia in Singapore, Angela in the Philippines, Suresh in Saudi, Zainer in Kenya, Jipin in Mumbai, hello to Sandra in London, Paul in Nigeria. And I could keep on going with so many different countries. Dubai is here as well, Botswana, Algeria. Isn't it great? Hong Kong, Sweden such a global audience. Well done, everyone. Thanks for coming along today. And I hope the time is suitable for you. Now I'm going to try to answer your questions as we go through this session, everyone. I'm just moving things around so that I can respond to the live chats that we're getting. Okay. Here we go, everyone. Let's bring up our slideshow. Uh, as I said, we'll begin with some uh, error correction. And then we're going to, after error correction, we're going to go on to a Q&A session. So I hope you've got some good questions there for me. Uh, things that might be concerning you regarding uh, grammar and OET preparation. Um, don't forget, uh, like us on the relevant Facebook and YouTube channels, and I'll talk about it later, but you can visit our website, OET Online, and here is the uh, website address, but we'll look at that a bit later. All righty. So I, as an English teacher, one of the jobs that I do on a daily basis is see a lot of writing submissions from students. And the one common thread that we see among language learners is um, a lot of the mistakes that are made are common um, to different, lang different language groups and common indeed among all learners. So if you can uh, review some of these common errors and learn from these mistakes, then you're going to reduce errors in your writing. And if you make, um, if you reduce your grammatical errors and improve grammatical accuracy, you can imagine your score 
will go up exponentially. So that's our goal, everyone, today. Help you with some of the common errors and address any grammar concerns that you may have. So I'm going to start with um, the present perfect, everyone, starting with the present perfect here, because um, with present perfect, it's a very difficult verb tense to get your head around because um, there's a degree of flexibility and, uh, and some variation in its use. And that actually leads to a lot of errors. But it's a very, very important tense because you're talking about a patient's history. You're describing a history over a period of time. And that's what the perfect tense allows you to do. Describe a person's um, progress over a period of time up to now. So here we go, everyone. Uh, let's look at the first sentence and I'll look, for, look forward to some feedback from you. So we've got Make it slightly bigger for you so you can view it clearly. All right, I hope that size is good. It says, Mrs. Finnegan has had type 2 DM and hypothyroidism for which she takes uh, levothyroxine 500 mcg daily and metformin 500 milligram twice a day. Now that might not look too bad, but actually there's a few errors there. Can anyone spot anything wrong with that? A particularly verb tense, but there's a few other things as well. Um, welcome to Lesotho in Zimbabwe while we're waiting. Hello to Benin in India. Celine, thank you for your support there. All right, so I'm just waiting for comments to come in. What errors can you see in this one? Just type in what you see. And we've got this has had, has had type two. There's something missing there. Can anyone spot what it is? I'll give you an opportunity. Um, Xtian says, for which she is taken, you could use, so we've got here for which she takes, we could say is taking, right? Look, the problem here is has had, has had type 2 diabetes. Now, look, I'll fix one thing. Look, I, I wouldn't use um, the short form there. I, I think it's better um, to write it in full. Um, just for consistency there. But it says she has had type 2 diabetes. Now, what that means is she has had, that indicates she's had it in the past, but may not have it now. And that's the problem there. When you use present perfect without a time reference like that, and particularly for an ongoing condition, it kind of indicates she's had these in the past but may not have them now. So princess has got it. Remove had. I agree with you, right? She, I would sip, just remove the had. She has type 2 diabetes mellitus and hypothyroidism because it's current, right? Now, if you do want to put a time reference, try this. I'll give you a few options there, everyone, to make that correct. We could do something like this. Has a history of type 2 diabetes. Now we're starting to sound more formal. And that way you've captured the past, right? So that's one way to do it. Yep. Well done, Joe, picking up on that one. And we could also, someone's mentioned since, thank you, Saran. If you wanted to use since, we'd have to put more detail. So we can use present perfect and we can say has had type 2 diabetes mellitus. Um, and then I would put since, and I just put a date, 2012, and hypothyroidism since 
2016 for which he takes that medication. So yes, Linu's got it. We want to put, we want to put uh, these conditions here, right? We want to, uh, we want to put, if we're going to use has had, then what we really need to do is make sure that our verb tense is in alignment, right? Now, someone's mentioning a comma before for which, look, I'd say the comma there is optional before for which. It's quite acceptable, not, don't have to have a comma here, but if you chose to separate it there, you could. Um, now that's fixed that one. So we, I also use present tense. And I went formal with has a history of. So they're all good options. Now, someone says, yeah, here's a great one. This I'm glad you asked. Someone said, can we say Mrs. Inukin has been having, right? And I'll just put XXX. And you can't do that, right? You can't do that because uh, the, the problem with that is having is a stative verb and we don't use stative verbs in the ing form, right? Uh, we, we can say she has been living with type 2 diabetes, right? That's a dynamic verb. So the rule here is do not use um, progressive form with native verbs, right? And now you can go onto Google and I suggest you all do that. Go and look up stative verbs and you get a whole list. Look up stative verbs. So here's a little bit of um, personal research, everyone. I would do this personal research. And then you'll be able to um, master this rule. Um, study, um, I'll just put compare stative versus dynamic verbs. Dynamic verbs can take the ing, but stative verbs, like knowing, we can't say I am knowing something, I know something, right? So there's a lot of stative verbs and having is one of them. We can't say I am having a glass or I'm, so, I, but I can say I have a glass. I'm holding a glass. Holding is dynamic. So do be aware of that. Um, Ahmad asks another good question. Can we say has been suffering from diabetes? Well, you could, but the question about that one has been suffering is, do you know she's been suffering? Because if the medication is effective, maybe she's not suffering it at all. Maybe she's not suffering at all. So I'll put a little note on that point as well. Um, with the verb suffer, and I'll answer this because it's common. With the verb suffer, well, uh, it's a bit of a loaded word. Um, it implies um, difficulties and pain, right? So for me, I wouldn't use that word with a condition that was well managed. She's got a metformin, so perhaps she's not suffering at all, right? And she doesn't want that label. She doesn't want that label of suffering. Right. But what if someone has a headache like um, migraine? Right. Now, migraine causes a lot of pain. Right. So I would say in that case, uh, if I wanted to use suffer, um, so avoid its use with well managed 
conditions, um, but it can be used um, with uh, nouns such as pain, headaches, migraines and so forth. Because we know that if you have pain, if you have a headache, if you have a migraine, you are suffering, right? So you've just got to decide when the appropriate time is. But that's a great case, a great example. All right. Sarah writes, has been experiencing, is that okay? Absolutely. Uh, Priyanka says, can we say a known case of? Yes, I mean, look. A no in case of, yes, I would say to you that's acceptable. Careful with its use. Um, that, that is a, a type of expression that health professionals use. I'd be cautious with it. I wouldn't overuse it. Um, but in the appropriate spot, I would say yes. All right. Okay, and Selena says, can I say she has been diagnosed with carcinoma of lung? Well, I would say of the lung. Okay, let's continue, everyone. So that's the first one. Wow, we got a lot of um, discussion out of that. Terrific work, everyone. So I'll make that little side point there. There we go. Now, the next one I've got here, everyone, is a very similar one. Because uh, I see there's actually a few similar ones here. Thank you for seeing this patient who has had carpal tunnel syndrome um, and requires further management by an occupational therapist for a wrist splint. Right. Thank you for seeing this patient who has had carpal tunnel syndrome. So this is the same thing, isn't it? Right. We're missing a time reference here. Right. So the easy way to fix this one, I, I won't spend too much time on it, but I would say thank you for seeing this patient um, who has carpal tunnel syndrome and requires further. I think we should put a comma here because this is extra information. So thank you for seeing this patient. And the extra information is who has carpal tunnel syndrome and requires further management. Once you do that, You've actually balanced your verbs. See how we're now um, balancing our verbs? Reads a lot better. Okay. Uh, someone mentioned name. Thank you, Sangeetha. Well, what if I did this, everyone? If I put in the line above, re Mary Smith, I'm going to put date of birth. 12, 10, we'll just put 94, right? So if I write it like this, then I can act, what do you think everyone? I can say this patient. I don't have to mention Mary Smith again. And why is that? Well, the reason is you can use this patient in, in the introduction because you're referring back to your subject line. So that gives you context. So in this circumstance, you could um, you could choose not to put the name um, because you're referring back to the subject line. If you're more comfortable with the name, of course, you do that. All right, I hope that's cleared that up. Okay, so we fixed that one. So let's go to the next one. Now, this is a funny one. Obesity is a tricky one. What are we going to do with the word obesity, everyone? She also has had obesity with a BMI of 32. How are we going to fix that? I'm going to look for your comments here, everyone. Uh, let's see what people say here. While I'm waiting, Gigi says, how to write history. Can I say she has a history of diabetes? Yes, you can. Um, Mary says, can we use the word patient in the letter? Yes, in that example I just gave you. 
But I wouldn't say this patient was unwell. Probably avoid that. Better to use their name. All right. Ganesh says he likes awesome online class, but I want more on writing scenario. Well, we're looking at uh, language use today, Ganesh. All right. Overweight, not a bad idea, Mary. Her BMI of 32 puts her at risk of obesity. That's excellent, Chris. Burke mentions put a time period. Yeah, lots of things coming through. I like that princess. She was classified as obese. Yes, because it this sounds funny. She has had obesity. Now that is the same problem. So I could remove that and say she has obesity. But is obesity something you have? Obesity is not really a an illness, is it? It's more a state, a state or a being. So I wouldn't do that, all right? I wouldn't do that. Motes says she suffered from um well, I don't really want to use suffer from either, right? I'll probably avoid that here. So how do we use obesity? Uh, well, a really nice one. So I'm going to put a few options up and we'll discuss it because it's a tricky one, a very tricky one. So someone wrote, look, she is also obese. It's correct, but then you're describing someone. So I probably want to um, avoid that one is where, where I'm coming from there. Uh, just, just a bit descriptive for my liking. Let me just bring up a page, everyone, to make this easier for me to drop up these things. So this is, she's also a beast. I'm not going to do that because we're describing her. A few people have said that. So no, I don't really want to do that one. Uh, how I would express that, I, I love what, let me find, there was a great one in there that somebody wrote. Let me find that. There's quite a few, got to go back a little bit. Yes, Princess did a lovely one. Have a look at Princesses, everyone. This will... Um, show you a good way to express it. If I write it like this, she was classified as obese. That's better because at least you're not describing she is obese. So that's better. Or I probably might write um, up here, she has a history of obesity with a BMI. So there's that history of, again, very useful expression. All right. She's overweight with a BMI. You could do that, Lance. She's in a state of obesity. Doesn't quite sound right. Um, okay, excellent. All right, let's move on from that one, everyone. Um, can everyone see the screen okay right now? I'll just refresh that, everyone. Okay. Now I'm going to move on to the next one, everyone. So put a little tick there just so you know it's correct. Okay. All right, and I've fixed that top one up there as well. Now we'll scroll a little bit further. Today on admission, Mr. Davies has been complaining of largely distended abdomen over the last four days. Now, um, this is an interesting one. We've got to think about meaning here, and I'll explain this one to you. So he's had a largely distended abdomen for the last four days. That's good. That means it's present perfect. But it sounds funny because we've got the time reference today on admission. So it's what Mr. Davies said to you, right? So I wouldn't use present perfect here, right? I would move because then it sounds like he was complaining for four days. 
So what I would do here is just say complained of. Um, yes, Zatan got it. Complained of. Now, abdomen is a cannibal now. So we do really want to put an article complained of a largely distended abdomen over the last four days. That's what he complained of. So we know what the condition is, a largely distended abdomen, and we know the time period. So that's present perfect when it shouldn't be used. Simple past, because you're referring to a particular time, which would be earlier in the day. Okay, and a few other options there coming through, which are also good. Well done. Now I'll move to the next one. Uh, in terms of his medical history, now this is a hard one, the word blind, right? And, and we've got since, which is really a present perfect marker. Uh, in terms of his medical history, he was blind on his left eye since 2010. So we got two mistakes there, everyone. See if you, I'll just highlight them. See if you can fix these ones, everyone. I'll give you a moment while I'm waiting. Um, Sana writes, Sana writes, four days of abdominal fullness. Look, I wouldn't replace distended with fullness. Distended is a medical term. So no need to use synonyms when the word in the case notes is perfectly effective. Um, I would advise against that. Excellent, Mashal. Today he presented with abdominal distension. Okay. Yep, so some people are saying on the next one now, and I'll start bringing that up. Um, he is blind or he has had left eye blindness. That's good, Chris. And I'd probably fix this up by writing this, everyone. In terms of his medical history, so we'll just say he has been blind. We don't want to use was. Let's get rid of that. He has, I wouldn't say has had, has had no divya. Um, and blindness is not, oh, who's okay with of on his left eye? I wouldn't say on. Look, I prefer we use in everyone. So blind in is the expression. He has been blind in his left eye since 2010. Okay. So blind is an adjective. He has been blind in. So we're going to remove those. in his left eye since 2010. Now, a few good examples coming in from other people. Um, Christine writes, at his left eye, not at. Um, I'll show you a few mistakes. Um, if I write something like this, whoops, that didn't work. Someone write, um, Ahmad writes, he had been blind. But if you write had been, had been, then he no longer is blind, right? A miracle. Hallelujah. But I don't think that's what the case notes are expressing. It's an ongoing condition. Yes, he's still blind exactly. All right. Uh, can we say he has blindness in his left eye? Yes, but I wouldn't say he has blindness. When you use blindness, you can say he has a, the old history of again. He has a history of, look, I would do this. He has a history of left eye. Someone wrote this, left eye blindness. There's your now. Since 2010. That's how you do it, everyone. That is how you do it. All right. Gigi writes, having pain in the shoulder. Um, no, I wouldn't say having pain, has pain in the shoulder. Okay. All right, lots of good ones coming through. Thank you for that. All right, I'm moving on, everyone. 
Um, just remember, a few people still missing out, just remember when you're using, people always make this mistake, use has been with since. You can't say, you can't say was or in um, is blind, okay? All right, I'm going to move on to the next one. Um, oh, Matat says, can we say impaired vision? Yes, you can say impaired vision or vision impairment. I think that's quite a, a modern term. Um, the only problem with vision impairment is, is it the same? I would base it on the case notes that you see if this is the sort of case that you get. Sometimes vision impairment could mean there's partial vision. Um, but definitely that's a common way. All right, let's go to the next one. Um, she is on the oral contraceptive pill for the last 12 months. She's on the oral contraceptive pill for the last 12 months. What do you think, everyone, for this one? She is on. So again, we've got a time period. This should be easy to fix. So we got a period of time. So we need a verb tense that describes a period of time from the past up to now, right? There's only one that we can use. Thank you, Irene. She um, has been taken or has been on. That's easy fix, isn't it, right? You really don't want to make these types of errors, everyone. Because um, you want to show your assessors that you um, have control. And I can also say she has been taking. These are both excellent, same, same. Now, a classic one, thank you, Gigi. So I want to show you something else that's really useful to correct while we're live. You could say using that's right. But look at this one, everyone. What happens? Sorry, I'll just... Put that up in a different way. Look what happens when I use a different verb, everyone. She has been commenced on oral consent. Now, once we use commenced on, we, we've got to change, right? Because commenced is a past date. So the first thing I'm going to do, like if you use commenced on for the previous 12, 12 months, that means she was continued to commence on, right? Taking, taking is a verb that can continue. You keep taking your medication, right? But commence is referring to a start point somewhere in the past. So you can't use present perfect uh, with a commencement date 12 months ago, right? So how are we going to fix this? Dan's got it, was commenced on, thank you. So you're going to say here, she was commenced on um, the oral contraceptive pill. It's a type of pill, put the article. She was commenced on the oral contraceptive pill, but she wasn't, it's, I've got to use a different time marker. And I'm sure you all know what this one is, 12 months ago. So then, what have I done? I've aligned my verb tense, my past tense verb, and it's in the passive because someone commenced her on it. The doctor commenced her on it. I've used a passive form. She was commenced on the oral contraceptive pill 12 months ago. And if someone's writing 12 months back, I find back a little bit, in, little bit informal little bit like spoken English, so I'd probably stick to a go. So remember that. Start something, commence something, begin something, or stop something. These verbs usually use past tense. But I will show you an exception, everyone. I could do this. She has recently been commenced on the oral contraceptive pill. Now, that's different. Now we don't know when, but I've got a time reference recently, right? So you can, this is about the only exception 
where you will see commence or start used with present perfect if it was something recent but that's not 12 months ago that's maybe 12 days ago right just recently i hope that's clear okay um and the other way of course if you could just put here she is currently taking the oral contraceptive pill right so that's if i wanted to use present tense so i'm showing you correct versions there to give you a little bit of variety. Okay, and you could also say she was placed on, she was put on. Yep, all those sorts of things are possible. Alrighty. Now I'm gonna move on. Um, now, someone asked, can I do speaking, says Marshall. Look, we do. I'll talk about that toward the end, Marshall, see if we can help you there. Now, the next one, today, we've got two more to go here, everyone. Today on admission, Mr. Davies has been complaining of, oh, we saw that one, didn't we? Yes, we, we, we can get rid of that one. Uh, let's move on down here. Miss Watson has informed of the results and the notification of all patients has arranged. Now, again, uh, there's a problem here. It looks like present perfect, but something's missing there because it should be passive. Uh, she has informed of the results, the results and the notification to all partners has arranged. So we've got two present perfect structures, but it doesn't match the verb because somebody informed her and somebody arranged it. It's been done. So we've got to go to passive. Well done. A lot of people are picking up on that. Miss Watson has been informed of the results and the notification has been arranged. Now, if we wanted to, someone mentioned this, I could do this. Miss Watson was informed and, and partners and all partners were arranged. Ah, a notification to all partners was arranged because was is referring to the partner. So I could do that. Okay, so simple past is fine there as well. However, um, present perfect um, is um, very um, useful to describe recent actions um, that are Mm, effective now or that are relevant now so we use present perfect in this sense right we do so i actually prefer present perfect in these situations but simple past just tells you really simple it just tells you it's a um a completed action so it's also okay Okay. Now, great. We've done we've done a lot of work. We spent nearly 30, 30 plus minutes just on present perfect. Uh, this and I got a large variety of responses from the audience. So, um, hope that's been a nice little um, example for you of the present perfect use and when it's appropriate. Um, now, I'm going to show you a couple more things. But what I'm going to do now, we've still got a little bit of time up our sleeve, everyone. So what I wanted to do, and I'll give you all a little opportunity there, is do a little bit of Q&A. So now one thing I think 
someone asked about speaking. Look, in this Q&A session, um, uh, I'm going to go back to your question in a moment, Om, Omano. Um, but this is open to um, all sorts of questions. So anything that you want to ask now, I'm happy to respond, grammar related or anything about the OET, let me know. And while I'm waiting for any questions from the audience, um, now a good, a classic mistake from Omano says, Omano says we shouldn't use was here, we need to use were, all partners um, were arranged, but the partners weren't arranged. This is an easy error to make. Was actually refers to notification and notification was arranged, notification to all partners. So actually using um, the singular form rather than the um, plural verb form is necessary here. Okay. Uh, Irene asks, when we signed a letter for dentistry, should we just write our name or should we also put dentist? Irene, I think both's acceptable there. You can put your name if you wish. Um, you know, it's just an exam or you just put dentist. So I'd say both okay. Uh, another question from Talent. Is it okay to use abbreviations in OET writing? Well, look, I'll mention it. Look, on abbreviations, on abbreviations, I'd say this, acceptable, it's acceptable if clearly um, understood by the reader. Absolutely. You know, if, if it says here, and, and some classic examples, you know, but you just have to look at, because it's not, that's not a straightforward answer to this question. There's variations and lots of nuances there. But look, on abbreviations, I'd say this. If it's doctor to doctor, nurse to doctor, or those sorts of things between professions that know um, the abbreviations, and I say, yes, use it. And, and the best example is, look at the OET center model letters to guide you because you'll see quite a lot of abbreviations there. If you're writing doctor to doctor or nurse to doctor, nurse to nurse, why do you need to say, if it says here a particular medication, um, and I can test this with the audience, but if I say, you know, I don't know, uh, what's a good medication name? Ome prazole. Um, I won't put the dosage because I could get it wrong. Uh, BD. But BD means twice a day, right? But you don't need to. You don't need to do this. The, the patient, or you know, um, Mrs. X was prescribed. You know, you don't have to change BD to twice a day. So I think that answers your question. You don't use that twice a day. Look, it's not really necessary. You know, you can, but if the reader understands BD perfectly well, then it's acceptable to use it. All right. So I would say in that case, uh, you can say twice a day or you can say BD. So I hope that answers it, your question. With abbreviations, if they're commonly known by who you're writing to, it's acceptable. But look at the OET uh, Center website as well for confirmation of what is acceptable there. Okay, I'm going to go through a few more questions. Um, Rafi says, on today's visit, at today's visit, both acceptable. On today's visit means the time. At today's visit means the location. So both good. Um, well, at can also mean, the, sorry, on can mean time, the actual day of week. At can mean time of day. So both acceptable. 
Um, Sarah writes, is it okay to write more than 200 words? Yes, the case notes say the task description says approximately. So a little bit over, it's, it's an approximate. Use the 10% rule, 10% over, okay. I'd be wary of going under though. Um, so I think I've got that. Um, now, some questions are coming through like Priyanka, when and where to use different tenses? Wow, that's a big question. Requires a lot of study there. Um, join OET online if you can, Priyanka. And that's what we specialize in. And it's a journey to build your skills over a period of time. Maybe it takes you a month, maybe three months, maybe six months, maybe a year. Um, but it just depends on your start point to gauge that. Um, Irene says, can we use a watch during the exam? No, I don't think you can, but there'll be a big clock or timer on the wall. Chris says, can we use a pencil in writing? Hmm. Yes, you can actually. Um, and you're encouraged to, a 2B pencil. Check the OET Centre website for that, but you can erase it. So that's a good question. Um, Sarah asks a classic question, how are the words counted? Um, well, it's an approximation, Sarah, but not the address. And look, to be honest, do we really count 12? I think you can say numbers aren't really part of it either. It, numbers more than words. Jessa says, what about writing less than 180? I'd advise against shorter letters because it uh, doesn't give enough content to be assessed. All right, now I'm going to jump over to another thread. So thanks. Those, those were a lot of questions coming through the OET Centre Facebook channel. Now I've got a few on OET Centre YouTube channel. So let's go with Marlene. On exam day, will you get notified when it's the exam, five minutes left, or will they just let you know where time's up? I believe you'll be notified, Marlin. Um, I, I had the um, opportunity to sit in on a test venue um, recently. And uh, at that particular test venue, uh, there was a great big projector that screened the time. So look, it'll be venue to venue. Uh, but yes, I think that will be made clear for you. And Princess says, how should we address a widow? Oh, look, if someone's a, a widow, Princess, I think you can, they can retain their married title. So I would use Mrs. Depan says, how can I improve my vocabulary? Weak part is reading. Could you give me suggestions? Well, look what I would do. Look for reading. That's just time and effort and every single time you do a reading everyone every time you read something you pick out that academic vocabulary that you don't understand and you keep a list do the old-fashioned way and then it's just memorizing when you're in the subway when you're on a train or when you're at home when you're doing that study you're learning those words all the time and those, those words will keep coming up and gradually they'll enter your vocabulary and like any language test, um, like any language test, you know, English, Eng learning an English language, I've learned a second language. I learned Japanese. I had my diction, I had all my tools, I had my dictionary, I had my notebooks, I had my, I kept my vocabulary list and it's a journey. So do all of those things to help you with reading, with, with your vocabulary, the pan. Few more questions coming through. <laughs> Omna wants me to make listing parts easier. Well, look, rather than making listing parts easier, work on improving your skills so it becomes easier. All right, but uh, that's at beyond my control. Uh, that's something from the OET Center. All right. And thanks. Adnarim, I'm glad it's been really helpful. 
Yeah, it's a bit of a new style, everyone. I wanted to, you know, a lot of the previous prep hours, we've been so busy on content. Nice to do something a little bit different, isn't it? A little bit of freedom there in what we do. Um, Davina says, how can we make an outline before writing? Look, just for writing, everyone, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up and I'll make that the last question, right? Because it's a good question, but it takes a bit of explaining, but I'm sure a lot of people worry about this. So the question is um, from Davina, maybe a few others. How do we make an outline? So basically she means a plan, doesn't she? An outline, a plan for writing. Now, how do you do that, right? Let's just wrap it up on that topic. Um, look, you get five minutes reading time, right? So during that five minutes reading time, that's all you can do is read and you can't make notes. So in that first five minutes of my advice, number one, look, first thing, one, um, start by reading the task question right? Because that way you'll know who you're writing to. Once you know who you're writing to, that's going to guide you um, to find out who you are writing to. That's essential, right? That's your first step, because that's going to inform you as to what they need to know. Then I would go after that, read the case notes. After five minutes, they're going to say, pick up your pen. They're going to say, pick up your pen, right? So when they say, pick up your pen, um, that's when you've got to make a bit of a plan. And what I would do, and, and the way I approach it, I look at, I, you have to decide, like decide, is it urgent? Um is it a discharge? Is it an admission? Look at these things to decide how you're going to do it. And then a basic rule of thumb, everyone. I encourage this for everyone. A basic rule of thumb is isbar. If you follow isbar, that should pretty well work for nearly all types, right? So what is isbar? We've spoken about it before. I introduce and identify your patient. And that means uh, when we say, what does that mean? Who are they? And this is all of these, everyone. Who, who's your patient? What, what's the condition? Where, where are they now? Um, why, why are you writing the letter, your reason? And who, what, and when? Um, I'll probably put when in, who, what, when, where, why? Ask yourself these questions. That's for your introduction. You know, when were they diagnosed? When did whatever happen, happen? All right, so that's your I. Then you're going to go S. S is for situation. Very important. That basically means what is happening now. It might go in your introduction or it might go in the first paragraph. Okay. B is for background. Um, so add relevant um, add relevant history, not don't add non relevant history, add relevant history to the case um, to um, to support um, uh, to support the information you've already provided to support the current um, condition. And then A is assessment. And for me, assessment, it, these are the things, um, what you have done. 
it could be tests, you know, investigations. Results, all that sort of medical stuff um, that you've done, because um, that's very useful information. Could be medications as well. And then finally, R, that's your request or recommendation. It could be like um, what you want to happen uh, to ensure. Um, continuity of care, right? And that's also commonly, if it's a discharge letter, then that's going to be the discharge plan, everyone. So there's a little outline for you. If you follow that with some variation and adjustment, you can't really go wrong, right? So I would go for ISBAR. Just remember with ISBAR, in some situations, um, you may leave out some part of it. The background information may be known to the reader. If you're writing to an existing um, health professional, an existing patient of a health professional, maybe you leave out the background. Uh, if it's an admission, the request might be really small, but if it's a discharge, long. Okay, so you vary it from case to case, but ISBAR is a flexible tool. And that's my advice to you. How does that sound, everyone? How does that sound? Now, I think we're done. I think we're done. Um, I'm going to go back to my... But I'll just wait for a bit of response there. Hopefully that's answered questions about planning. Very, very important. All right, I think that's hit the nail on the head there. And um, what do you think of this Q&A style, everyone, where we really opened it up? I think that was quite useful. What do you think? Um, if you're watching the video, I hope this has been useful. All right. Well, we might look into these things a bit further on, everyone. Um, so I wish you good progress. And I'm just going to share a little success story, everyone. Um, congratulations to Khalid, a doctor from Syria. Uh, he just did a study program with us and got a lot of success. Look at these scores, everyone. 450 for listening, 360 reading, 400 speaking. But look, 360, it's his lowest score, but I think this is what he was most proud of um, because he, he got that B grade that he really needed. Um, and he said his biggest fear was OET writing. So if writing's your fear, come and study with us to get rid of that fear. And he, he said our course was super comprehensive and it guided the candidates through the criteria, lots of practice, examples, lots of set video sessions there. Um, and he said it was the right tool to prepare for the exam and master it with confidence. And he's recommended us. So whether you're going for Australia, UK, US, Ireland, New Zealand, doesn't matter. We can help you. And in terms of our timetable, everyone, if you are interested, look, this is what's happening now. So we have a 10 a.m. time slot. That's Brisbane time. And a 10 a.m. time slot. That's London time, like the flag. So Mondays, grammar, two live classes per day. You'll find me teaching on that morning grammar slot every Monday. Um, and then we also have an evening time slot as well, uh, evening in Australia, but morning in the UK. Tuesdays is our reading day. Same, two live classes per day. Uh, we also have an allied profession class. So if you're a dentist, a pharmacist, a physio, or any of the allied professions, Join us on Tuesdays for our live allied profession writing class. Wednesdays, two live speaking classes. Thursdays, two live listening classes. Um, we're always doing something interesting and in exam preparation, part A, part B, part C, lots of live skill building. And each class has different content. 
Then finally on Fridays, we have a nurse only writing class. Now nurses, two live classes per day. One in the morning time slot at 8 a.m. Brisbane time. The other is at 10 a.m. and that's in the UK time. And doctors, same for you. We have a morning 10 a.m. slot and in Brisbane and also a morning in the UK, 10 a.m. as well. But that's UK time for our doctors only writing classes. And all our classes are recorded and available for viewing. So jump on board, everyone, if your exam's getting close. Uh, and I'm going to give you one last link, everyone. One last link. And just sign up if you're interested. We've got a free trial course, everyone. I'll just put that in the message there. Click on that link, everyone. I've just put in the chat. If you click on that link, that's going to take you to our sign up page. Don't have to commit now. Check out the free trial course. If you like what's happening, then join one of our great programs, everyone, so that you can pass OET on your next attempt. We've got a contact email if you've got any questions just visit our website. All right. Thanks, everyone, for coming today. Wish you good progress, and we'll see you again soon. Bye for now.